Good evening. Tonight's forum is being brought to you by the League of Women Voters of Alameda, which is a 501c3 corporation run entirely by volunteers and dedicated to the education of voters. I'm Susan Hauser, serving as president of this chapter, and thank you for being with us tonight for this City Council Candidates Forum. Thank you to candidates for your time and energy in this evening's program. Just a few housekeeping items to cover. This forum is being recorded and will be available on our website, lwvalameda.org. Audio and video are off for the audience. In other words, you will not be visible to others and your audio is muted. We will not be taking questions live for this forum. Each candidate will be asked to give a 30 second introduction with the candidate speaking in the same order that their names appear on the ballot. Questions have been collected from the community and will be asked of each candidate by the moderator with two minutes each to respond. For the questions we do not have time to ask, please contact the candidates directly through their websites. Each candidate will have two minutes for wrap up in reverse order from the introductions. I'd like to introduce this evening's moderator, Administrative Vice President of our league, Ann McCarrigan. There we go, unmuted. Good evening, everyone, and good evening, candidates, and thank you for your time. So to start, let's begin with the just 30 second quick introduction, and our first speaker will be Mr. Jim Odie. Thank you, thank you to the League for putting this on and for continuing to remind me to pay my dues on time. Uh, my name is Jim Odie. I've been honored to serve as your council member for the last six years. I'm proud that together we've improved emergency operations, we've made significant investments in safe streets for all, and we've secured landmark advances in affordable housing, tenant protection, and compassionate solutions for our unhoused neighbors. My vision and purpose in public service is to defend an Alameda that is inclusive, welcoming, and resolute. Now that we face the greatest economic and public health challenges we've seen, I'm ready to meet this moment. That's why I would be honored to have your vote to continue serving as your council member. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get the timer ready and then go to our next speaker. All right, Trish. Trish Spencer, you'll be our can, next speaker. Can you hear me now or is it still? Yeah. So I'm, you, can, you can't hear me? We can, oh, we can hear you, okay. yeah. All right, okay. Um, uh, Good evening, everyone. Thank you to the League for putting this on. Uh, most of you know me. I'm Trish Herrera Spencer. I'm a former mayor of the city of Alameda, the first Hispanic Latina mayor, and I come up from the school board. And honestly, uh, I try my hardest to represent everyone. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Spencer. I'm sorry, that was only 15 seconds, and you gave us yeah. 30 seconds. So she has an additional 15 yeah. seconds, if you don't mind, please. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Okay, so um, yeah, I got, it, we got a little held up. So, um, Keisha, could you put 15 seconds on the on the timer? Uh, no, we don't have a 15 second okay. timer. Okay. Uh, let's just well, I think by, by the time we're finished here, we're going to probably hit about 15. And Tricia, if you'd like, Miss Miss Spencer, excuse me, if you would like to sure. finish up, that would be great. There you go. Okay, so uh, I appreciate the uh, rest of my time. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I've. Uh, I was elected twice to the school board prior to becoming mayor. I really try my utmost to be available to everyone so that they can always come, reach out to me, and then I do my utmost to listen and then make decisions. Thank you. Okay, we'll get the timer reset and then we will hear from Mr. Gig Kodiga. So Gig, if you can wait. Mr. Kodiga, if you can wait until the, there we go. So if you'd like to go ahead. Well, can I restart it? I just, I just hardly breath, breathe. Uh, this is Gig Kodiga. I'm running for our city council. Um, I look for your independent support 
Thank you, League of Women's Voters, by the way. I want to start off with that. Uh, my ambition is to serve Alameda as a public servant, I, and I will serve Alameda and listen to Alameda whether they're new or they're old. I believe they all have a voice. I think Alamedans have a bigger voice than other voice, just to make sure we understand that. I, earned, I went through the public schools in Alameda. I was an uh, MBA at uh, UC Berkeley. I have uh, served on boards in the community, including the Boys and Girls Club Board for 35 years and a two-term unopposed Alameda Board of Education member. I came to Thank you. I, Thank you, Mr. Kodiga. That's your 30 seconds. We'll get to the, we'll get you more time at the end. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Ms. Malia Vela. And once we get, there we go. So we are ready to go. Good evening and thank you to the League of Women Voters for putting on this forum tonight. It's been an honor to serve as your council member for the last four years. As your council member, I've been accessible and proactive in engaging the community to ensure that Alameda embraces everyone. I'm a native Alamedan with deep roots here and I'm committed to working together with you to preserve what's best about Alameda and move forward on needed improvements. I've worked to cap annual rent increases and enact just cause tenant protections, bring lactation and diaper changing stations to city buildings and break ground at Alameda Point. Thank you. And then rounding up the introductions will be Mr. Amos White. Let's get our timer reset there and he'll be ready to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, League of Women Voters. Um, I'm Amos White, he, him, um, and um, I'm happy to be here to present tonight on Ololi, Ololi land. I am founder and CEO of 100,000 Trees for Humanity. I live here with my young family and two kids at Encinal High School. I'm running to be your choice for city council member, and I'm running to bring fairness, equity, and open governance back to our city. Um, here to restore good governance um, as I've been working in and out of government um, on policy for the past 30 years. And I'm here to seek your vote. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. So now we'll, we be, we'll begin with our first question. As you mentioned, these are questions that came in from the community. And uh, the first question will be directed to Ms. Spencer. So I'll start that. And then once the clock gets going, you'll have your two minutes. As a council member, what would you do to better maintain the city's infrastructure? Okay, so, um, to, so there's something going on with my screen. I'm not sure what's happened, but no, you're good. You're okay. good. Um, so to to better, we've actually, and most of us know this, we've really struggled trying to maintain uh, our roads. Um, if you we're thinking of that as our infrastructure. Uh, what can we do better, honestly? Uh, I think it comes down to budget issues. Uh, we have tried and we have actually, when I was on the Alameda County Transportation Commission, I was actually very successful at receiving monies for our city. Uh, other than the city of Oakland, we received uh, the most of, every, of any city in the county for our um, you know, roads, transportation, different things like that. It was approximately $35 million. And a lot of those monies, uh, we have to honestly work with our uh, partners and try to advocate to bring in more monies to do this because as a smaller island, approximately what 80,000 people, it's really hard for us to keep going back to the taxpayers for more and more to do this. And then we count on our staff to uh, do their best to figure out um, and communicating with the public of how what is the best way to spend the limited monies that we have and how to prioritize our projects. And honestly, so my role and what I've tried to do throughout, uh, you know, my years as being an elected official is to reach out to the public to get input from them. What are your priorities and then uh, communicate with staff and, and work with our council members. Okay, thank you. All right, next we'll, the question will go to Mr. Kodiga. So we will get the timer reset and I'll repeat it. As a council member, what would you do to better maintain the city's infrastructure? And then as soon as the timer hits, it, there you go. So first of all, we want to identify where our gaps are, where our issues are, and then we can assess the uh, uh, cost to fix those up. And then we can take a look at how we're going to fund it. We do have a lot of issues we have to deal with, I suspect. I've been thinking about infrastructure here for the last 20 years. Uh, so I think the sewer system that we've been fixing is a, 
an absolute positive direction to go. It may require taxes, but in this kind of world we're in right now, we cannot afford to have more taxes out there. We're in a really critical environment. So uh, we just have to look at state funding, regional funding, uh, grants, whatever we can to, uh, to uh, work that out. We work with the city, uh, 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 city employees to identify the staff, to identify what's going on, provide suggestions, and uh, work our way through what those uh, infrastructure needs are going to be. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next will be Ms. Vela, and we'll get that. Hold on while we get the timer reset. Did you need the question read again? Oh, nope, there we go. You set for the question? Yes. Um, and so, you know, we've done a lot, and, and actually in the last two years, we've been able to accomplish a lot. Uh, we updated our uh, sewer fee in order to help uh, with infrastructure um, that passed and, and it's going to good use and going to help address a number of our infrastructure needs. Um, we're also working with our regional partners. We were able to get money um, from things like RM3 to help with our uh, get our third ferry, uh, ferry terminal at Alameda Point. Um, the Seaplane Lagoon Ferry Terminal. I was happy to work on that um, to go to WIDA as well to advocate for the city. Um, we're working on adding another West End Crossing with the Bike Ped Bridge, as well as the Cross Alameda Trail. We were able to get um, re funding through ACTC and other organizations to help with that. Um, we're also looking at, you know, we, we've been regularly up, uh, upgrading our street surfaces. We have a program for that. And we've been doing that citywide um, and, and that's continuing to move forward. Uh, and I, that's been able to move forward is things like the fact that um, through our legislative priorities, we've supported uh, the measures that have helped increase statewide funding for that, like the increased gas tax. Um, and so by doing that, we're not impacting our general fund. We're able to continue those infrastructure upgrades that are much needed. We do have um, unmet infrastructure needs. Part of how we've been able to address that out of uh, at Alameda Point is to get the developers to pay to make sure that we get that very necessary backbone infrastructure. That's going to allow us to do things like our reshape project, which is going to include a lot of much, uh, much needed affordable housing. Um, and so I'm excited to see those projects come forward. We've just selected a developer for that. And it's somebody who's uh, knowledgeable, local, uh, and has worked with our housing authority in the past. Thank you. Mr. White, we'll hear from you next as soon as we get that timer reset. There we go. Yes. There we go. Now, yeah. there we go. Okay. We've, okay, there we go. We've restarted the timer. Thank you. So, um, in regards to infrastructure, um, we, we have $300 million in backlog of work that needs to be done to keep our storm drains um, from polluting the bay, to keep our water parks and buildings safe, and to maintain our streets and sidewalks. Um, we really need to look hard. Yeah. Um, the impact of COVID is, is really going to negatively impact our budget um, moving forward, perhaps after I've been told, um, after June of next year. Um, and we really are going to have to look at where those funds are going to come from. We do know that um, um, we also have a problem of, of or if you will, that um, we, we can look at um, freeing up cash, I should say, um, without raising taxes, where taxes alone just won't solve the problem. Um, there's just no way we can take on the infrastructure problems, nor climate, nor transportation, um, if we can't free up cash flow by reducing existing expenditures. Um, uh, I, I've been saying I, I support the city manager's midterm budget recommendation um, that would pause $200 million um, in the backlog of capital improvement work. We really need to rethink things right now in a period of COVID. Um, and look at where we can, again, target cash. Um, we have an opportunity with, um, um, I should say, uh, the police department, where um, Chief Rolari worked with uh, uh, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Knox White and, 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 and Councilmember Brody to come up with 42% of our potential reallocation of funds that we could put towards uh, programming for one. But then we could also um, work with, if you will, our unions to negotiate changes to benefits to a level that results in a, manage, um, a more manageable uh, uh, liability. Um, and then we have to work with the city to fund it. Um, those are just some of the things that I would look at in terms of where we could find cash to actually 
put towards um, the infrastructure issues. Thank you. And Mr. Odie, you will be our closing statement on this one. Okay, thanks very much. I, I think Malia, my council member colleague, uh, mentioned a lot of these. So if I repeat what she said, I apologize. But this is something we've actually been working on as your council members. Um, SB1 has uh, brought $15 million worth of road repair money uh, to Alameda over 10 years. And thankfully, the voters uh, upheld SB1 by defeating Prop 6 a couple years ago. Uh, we've done a lot of work on traffic infrastructure, whether it's closing the Atlantic Gap, uh, trying to acquire parcels to finish the bike trail over at Tilden Way, uh, getting the, the Cross Alameda Trail all the way out to, to Main Street. Those are things that we've worked on. I mean, out of the $300 million in, in infrastructure projects, a hundred million of it or a third of it relates to um, basically sea level rise adaptation type of projects. And thankfully our city council uh, pr proposed and our voters approved the uh, Prop 218 election about 30 million in infrastructure projects. So that's money that can go right away to um, improve our storm drains and pumping stations and work on some of the high priority items that was identified in the CARP. Uh, personally, I think that, you know, we need to dedicate our infrastructure dollars and any future uh, infrastructure bond money to sea level rise adaptation uh, and resiliency projects. And I, I love the Veterans Hall, but you know, I'm not sure if that's something where we need to spend our money right away. Um, Alameda Point, Malia mentioned Alameda Point, and you know, we just approved a master infrastructure plan and it costs it's $1.6 million per acre for infrastructure improvements there, but between developers and the VA we'll be working on that. Um, you know, on the budget, I know that we had $100 million estimated revenue in COVID, but it actually turned out to be $110 million. And the city manager's protected budget of expenses of $103 million actually came out a lot better, like $98.9 million. So I think we're doing a good job managing our finances. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks to you all. So speaking of the budget, we're going to get into a couple of questions around that. Um, so the first candidate to answer this will be Mr. Kodiga, and the question is, oh, it's Kodiga, excuse me, how do you suggest the city, oh, let's see if we can get Mr. Kodiga up on the screen. There we go. Okay. So um, I'll ask the question and then we'll get the timer started. How do you suggest the city make up funds lost from the budget due to COVID-19? Well, it's a good question. It's a tough question because we don't know exactly what sources we can get it from. I would look at right-sizing each of the departments to see what, what, what excess uh, activities we're doing that may not be critical or core to those departments uh, and assess that. I would look at trying to find some other ways of, of uh, efficiencies within uh, through the uh, directors and managers of those departments and work from the bottom up to see if we could do a bottom up uh, budget uh, to see where we could find the money. The other aspects where we could do the budget is to uh, really make sure that our credit risks are, are safe and that we're, we aren't being uh, charged more than we need to be because we have failed in our financial audit uh, to report in a timely manner, which I think is critical to avoid wasting money on interest rates as opposed to spending money on social services and other uh, features we have here. Uh, you know, I, I'm not suggesting furloughs. I'm not suggesting cutting wages at this point. I, I have to take a look at it. I don't know enough about the budget to see what direction it will go. But I, that would be one of my key areas as a business executive and understanding what those risks are. That's where I would focus my attention. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. We will hear from Ms. Vela next. Our timer seems to be set. There you go. So, uh, you know, we're very fortunate in that uh, we had a prudent city council. Um, since I've been on council, I've been happy to support putting money into our reserves when times were good. We have 39% in our reserves right now, um, which is, uh, you know, very, very healthy. Um, we've also made sure during COVID to be very thoughtful about reallocating funds. So we reallocated some of our special funds uh, from at, you know, our advertising funds, our, our uh, facade grant program 
to help out with some of our COVID needs, especially pertaining to helping our small businesses. We need them to thrive and to continue to be here so that um, they're here after COVID as well. Um, uh, additionally, we've done a lot of other things. We, we applied for and got the maximum amount of CARES Act funding, which was over a million dollars. Half of that went to uh, reimbursing general fund expenses. We're now about $200,000, only $200,000 um, out of our general fund um, to help with COVID related expenses. 500,000 of that um, went to helping our small businesses, our tenants, um, we also uh, have put money in on Tuesday night, we approved the block by block program as well as expanding our day center hours um, into the evening and into the weekend for our unhoused populations. Um, we're also making sure that we um, really uh, are, are critical in how we're um, getting the best bang for our buck uh, in those regards. Additionally, we were not as adversely impacted as other cities because we are, our budget is not as reliant on sales tax or occupancy tax. Um, and in that regard, um, we've been uh, doing better. Uh, additionally, as Jim mentioned, um, our budget is on track or within the budget uh, as projected. Um, and we're also keeping track of our public safety hours and, and anything that's gonna be FEMA uh, reimbursable so that we can recoup those funds as well. Thank you. All right, now we will hear from Mr. White. Amos, there we go. Thank you. Um, if you could restate, please. Sure, can we stop the timer? There we go, thank you. The question is, how do you suggest the city make up funds lost from the budget due to COVID-19? Yeah, um, and thank you. Um, First off, I would say mm, my budget priorities would focus first on retaining workers. Um, if we're going to have a sustainable physical future, we really need to be thinking beyond the current budget cycle, and we really need to be um, looking at how we can retain um, the limited staff that we do have um, um, if we're going to um, actually you know, try to achieve that. Um, um, I would agree with council women, uh, member uh, uh, Vela, who, um, 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 where I would also seek to continue the council policy um, to place a portion of the general fund over a given amount um, for payments reducing Alameda's unfunded post employment liabilities. Um, setting that aside is, is, is good policy um, and, and good, uh, good budgeting, I should say, for the future. Um, for good fiscal policy. And I think we should look at um, negotiating continued employee sharing of contributions um, to these benefits, spreading the load between funding other post-employment benefits, um, for one. I think we also should explore um, other options, um, more physical options, if you will, like um, hybrid-defined contributions like benefit plans um, and contribution plans that we should be looking at for future employees. Um, we really need to get a handle, if you will, on, on what we have, as I said before, and try to seek to free up cash um, um, within the city. Um, I'd also like to explore, um, um, or I'd say I'd like to advocate for making a referral for a single payer healthcare system that reduces medical costs for Alamedans. Um, it's been shown to um, be very positive in, in um, a couple other cities as well. And it and produces savings. So again, um, those are some of the policy measures that I would take and seek to, 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 to pursue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Odie, the question goes to you next. Thank you. And you know, just to recap those numbers, our original 1920 uh, budget had 100 million in estimated revenue, 100.8 million. And then in the mid-year, we bumped that up to 1.78. And then in the spring when COVID hit, uh, we bumped that down to 100 million, and the actual turned out to be higher than all of those at 110 million. And like I mentioned, our our expenses actually came in lower. So you know what that's done is given us a 39% reserve, as Councilmember Vela said. And you know she kind of mentioned everything that the council has been working on to help our our residents today. So I'm not going to recap those. Um, but with that 39% reserve, you know we do have a cushion in, in case there are problems. Um, in, in checking in with the city manager about our budget, you know, the set, uh, businesses could have deferred their sales tax payments uh, during COVID, but 
Most Alameda businesses didn't, so that hasn't hurt us either uh, when it comes to sales tax revenue. Just to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the structural things, um, you know, our safety employees contribute 4% of their salary uh, to their OPEB trust that we created my first year on council, in addition to 15% of, of their salary for pensions, which is 4% higher than the state law allows us to do automatically. So that's 19% of their salary. So basically, our public employees are giving $1 for every $5 they make to pay for benefits that we promised them, and I don't think anyone anywhere could say that they're doing that. There was no raise in 2019, so that helped us out. Um, you know, we had 500000 set aside uh, for OPEB when I came to office, and right now that, that's about $14 million. So that policy where we set aside 50% of our what we call our reserve surplus, so if we're over 25, uh, we per, we put half of what we're over 25 into this fund, and like I said, $14 million, and that's already saved us a million dollars a year going forward. So I think we've been fiscally prudent, fiscally sound, and as your council member, we'll continue to do that. And I like the fact that your cat is weighing in on the subject. So, in the okay, middle thank of my you. Speech. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's what our pets are for, right? Okay. So, um, staying on the lines with the budget right now is um, to each of you. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, sorry Miss Spencer. My apologies. My apologies. Okay. I got so excited when I saw the cat. Okay. <laughs> yes, Miss Spencer. Um, let me repeat the question since I interrupted. How do you suggest the city make up funds lost from the budget due to COVID-19? Okay, so I, first of all, I want to frame this for the public. And uh, the audit that just came back, it was pretty darn late. And it included some material weaknesses and significant deficiencies, which as far as I know, it's the first time our audit has had those things that actually go to questioning the, uh, uh, for, uh, the numbers themselves. And so it's important to keep that in mind. The last, the current uh, expenditures are exceeding the revenues and uh, the current five-year forecast has, has the city, the forecast uh, exhausting the reserves by the year 2023, 2024. As far as I know, that's the first time we've been doing that also in the past. Uh, another thing that happened that there's been several um, candidates referencing is, uh, taking money to pay down the uh, unfunded pension liability that's uh, over $250 million for pension and over $100 million for uh, OPEB, which is other post-employment benefits, uh, which is big numbers, right? And in fact, early on when I uh, was mayor, I went to an event and on a per capita basis, they used our city as an example as having the highest on a per capita basis of unfunded pension liabilities. In regards to setting aside money to help pay that down, that didn't happen this year, and that's about $8 million. And so uh, that needs to be uh, shared publicly. So that is no longer happening. It did happen a couple of the years that um, I was mayor. Uh, but a problem with it, honestly, is that there, now that we're not doing it, and obviously I think it was evident we weren't going to be able to, when you look at our general fund, um, of approximately 100 million, most of that money, honestly, is uh, salaries. So we actually don't have a lot of places to make it up without touching our employees and looking at contracts that all, that go to the uh, personnel. Thank the you. rest of our budget. Okay, thank you. Nope. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, but don't worry. We are going to, as I was starting to say, we are going to stay with the budget. And uh, Ms. Vela, you will be the first to respond to this question. What is the biggest issue affecting the budget and what would you do to address it? I think our biggest issue is, of course, uh, our unfunded liabilities. And uh, I have been doing things to address it. I was proud to vote uh, to put uh, for the policy to set aside the money into our OPEB trust. Uh, I was proud to, to vote to set aside uh, the funds uh, it, uh, into uh, being able to pay things down like our, our PERS liability. Um, part of, uh, you know, this is really about being fiscally prudent when, uh, when your uh, revenue exceeds uh, what you anticipate. And that's why these policies are so important. And I was so proud to support them, along with the majority of the council, 
uh, and supporting those budgets. Um, not, not every member of the council uh, did that. Unfortunately, our mayor voted against the budget um, and had another person voted against it, would have been in, we would have been in violation of our fiduciary duties to make sure that we have a, a balanced budget uh, and we're, we're uh, doing the things that we need to do to put money aside. Um, additionally, we've been putting money into our reserves um, where we, we, as I said, we have about 39 million in our reserves right now. That's substantial. Uh, we're doing much better and we've, we've done a lot in the last four years um, and in particular in the last two to make sure that we are fiscally solvent. Um, things that we're doing to address it in 2013, there was the PEPRA law that came into place. Um, there's going to be a lot of things that, that are going to improve that by the fact that we do have people uh, leaving or retiring and we have new hires who don't have the same um, post-employment uh, liabilities being generated by them. Um, our staff continues to work on this and negotiate and work with our, our, um, our employees, but there's two things that a city provides. One is the infrastructure, uh, the other is the services. And so we need those employees and we need to be able to recruit good employees and work with them to make sure that we're all in a place where we're fiscally solvent together. And I've been proud to work with our employees in doing that. Thank you. Mr. White, you'll be the next to respond to this question. Thank you. Um, I mean, as has been cited, we have, um, in terms of retiree medical benefits, over $102 million as of uh, the report this year. $186 million in pension plans for city employees that are underfunded. Um, we, we, we really need to look at things differently. Um, I think in terms of best case scenario, um, to um, pursue a conversation on the unfunded liability uh, as that elephant in the room. Um, pensions, um, they're pretty well protected by law. Uh, and so um, the OPEB that um, the, uh, uh, former Mayor uh, Spencer had said, um, the, the retiree medical, has been shown to be more negotiable. So we need to work with unions to change benefits to a level that, or to levels, I should say, that result in uh, manageable liability, then the city needs to, as I was saying before, needs to fund it. So um, uh, maybe floating a bond. So employees need to somehow um, um, at the, in that kind of a scenario, give up some benefit um, for more certainty. Um, the city gets a number that we can swallow and we just got to deal with it. Um, but we really need to take things on, I think, um, together um, as a city, um, employees, um, and with our, our fiscal staff, meaning our, our treasurer, our auditor, um, our, our chief finance person, um, informing um, that process so we can come up with um, um, a workable solution that's good for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And Mr. Odie? Thank you. Um, you know, just to pick up on a couple things that I didn't mention before. Oh, I, wait a minute. Hold on for just, oh, no, we're, we're good. Sorry. Councilman Marvella mentioned PEPRA, so uh, I didn't have anything to do with PEPRA. Uh, but since PEPRA, new employees pick up a greater share of their normal cost. Um, since 2014, on our OPEB, you know, our contracts say that there's no retirement health coverage for spouses or newly hired employees. Uh, so this is something that our council has been working on uh, diligently. I mean, I remember when uh, uh, the original forecast for fiscal year 17, 18 came out. Uh, it was project back in, in 2013. It was projected to be a negative 11% in reserves and an $8.3 million operating deficit. And people were saying, you know, shut the doors at City Hall, the lights are going to go out. Well, I was on the council the next four or five years, and we actually increased our reserve policy uh, by that time to 25%. And our actual reserve not, wasn't minus 11%, it was 32% before we did the pension uh, contribution. And there's nothing that if... Um, 2021 turns out to be as good as uh, 1920 that we couldn't contribute even more to that um, pension fund, uh, even the 7.9 million that, that we deferred. Um, you know, these numbers go out five years. It's hard to predict what's going to happen in five years, but there's always a caveat behind that, and that's this is what happens if we do nothing. And we also tend to underestimate transfer taxes. You know, they, they typically come in almost double the amount. Uh, in reality than they do in projected, but that's conservative and that's good because these are one-time monies, so we don't want to do that, but I appreciate the work of people like Marie Gilmore and Lena Tam who actually got our transfer tax increase back in 2008. And just to finish on something Malia mentioned, 
you know, we're being criticized by one candidate here about this, but that candidate voted against the pension plan, voted against OPEB, and even voted against the ministerial act of moving the budget money over, which could have subject us to a lot of liability. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Odie. And uh, Ms. Spencer, you will have Could the opportunity the to question? go next. I certainly shall. What is the biggest issue affecting the budget, and what would you do to address it? Okay, I'm going to say the biggest issue affecting the budget is that we have a special interest group in town that has uh, at least two uh, usually council members that are uh, pitching them. And when you look at what has happened to our budget, uh, back when I first became mayor, when uh, Russo was our city manager, uh, the contract for public safety came in front of us, and that was a three to two vote with member Desog and myself voting no. Uh, right then, I think, sadly, we, pri we continued to prioritize police and fire over all departments. And if you look at what people have to pay, well, there is, I want to squeeze this in, um, there is a reason why there, uh, the forecast instead of going down has gone up on some areas. It's because we have actually increased our sales tax. We have increased the UUT. So we have increased taxes to regular folks so that we can continue to uh, prioritize public safety, which is police and fire. And um, that is a problem. If, when you go to the library, when you try to use something at the parks, you have to pay more. But it's impacting regular folks Services have, have been reduced during all of this time. Uh, and, and we used to have a pie that had more equal parts for different departments. That's not what happens anymore. And it is a huge problem. And yes, it actually then results in the unfunded pension liabilities, the OPEB, all of that, the majority of all of that is for two departments in our city. We've, and if you look, look at the grand jury report, obviously we have two council members that have prioritized, I'm gonna say extremely unfairly, one special interest group, it needs to be reined in and has, it has created serious financial problems for our city. It's actually also taken staff time. If you look at the last year and a half while I was mayor, all these investigations. Your time up. Thank these. you, thank you, thank you. Um, and I would like to take a moment, just ask the candidates to keep your responses to your um, statements on, on subject matter so that we can stay focused on the questions that have been presented. Thank you. And Mr. Kottega, I believe you are up next. Would you like to hear the question again? Uh, no, the question is, uh, what's the biggest fi uh, financial uh, uh, issue for Alameda? Well, obviously everybody thinks the same thing. It's the uh, pension and the uh, obligations that are unfunded. And that's true, the biggest amount that we have to deal with. Uh, but that comes in, uh, and what we need to do is figure out how to balance that against all the other items we want to do uh, for the city, all the other services we want to do. How do we address it? You know, it's going to take a lot of uh, heart and soul to work our way through it. Yes, there's some good news, which is I'm glad to hear from uh, Jim and uh, Malia that uh, we are uh, running a surplus. I do think, though, that uh, or we're running in ahead of what we expected, but I'm not too sure if those numbers, as Trish said, are really uh, are valid because of the delay in the reporting that we've had. So I can't tell which is which is right, but I'm glad to hear that's moving forward and that there's good news in that category. Uh, I do think we have to be careful about what that is. It's uh, as far as the unfunded obligations, as taking the steps to do it, we take some time to take a look at all the various pieces that are a part of the budget. As uh, Trish said, 80 percent or so, or always has been, was at the school district, it was salaries and, and labor costs. And we have to be careful about how we handle that. Uh, we do want to have good, effective people. We want to make sure they're paid and treated right. We want to make sure their equity and their just, justice and, and that, uh, that they're treated appropriately and that they're not uh, fearful of uh, making a decision that may be counter to what the city council wants. We need to have them be share a voice. They're the, they're mostly the experts, they understand what to do. They've actually done a lot of great stuff. They've gotten all these fundings, all these grants, they've worked hard to do that. I'm very proud of the fact that they've spent time helping the city council be effective. So that's great, glad to have them. Okay, thank you very much. I think I got it right this time and I believe everyone has responded to that question. 
So we will move on to question four, and Mr. White, you will be the first to answer this question. As a council member, what would you do should Measure AA not pass? And AA for the audience is the measure to um, extend the, um, can you cite the measure if you don't mind? Or do you have it? No? I don't have it readily okay. available. So AA in, would, in, uh, right, it would, it would extend the powers and the authority of, of the uh, city attorney, um, um, if I have that correct. So um, what would I do should it not pass? Um, I've been advocating that we, as a city, in order to avoid the past charges and problems of corruption that we've had, um, we need a separation of powers and we need a checks and balance system. I would be, I would put forward a referral for a charter amendment or put a char charter amendment proposal forward to have the city attorney's office um, um, made separate um, from city government. Um, to uphold the charter and enforce the charter separately, much like Oakland and other cities do have. Even as a charter city, we can do that. Um, we need a check and balance on council right now. It's, it's a unicameral system, all controlled by council. And um, unfettered power um, needs to be checked. Um, and, and that would be one way to do that. Um, in terms of what that measure puts forward, um, I'm not comfortable with the fact that it increases the authority of the city attorney to, um, if you will, prosecute misdemeanors um, and these lesser crimes when we're actually in a period in our country's history trying to decarcerate, if you will, um, 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 many different systems and trying not to penalize, if you will, as we've seen that um, a lot of these fines, these lower uh, um, infractions have been um, issued with bias. And so trying to move that out um, as opposed to actually put that into our city right now, I think is um, the wrong direction to be going in. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And let's see, we, Mr. Odie will be answering the question next. Thank you. I think that AA has three components and the first one deals with the city attorney's ability to enforce our laws. And the intention there is to enforce things like our minimum wage ordinance, to enforce things like our rent, our rent control ordinance, and to enforce things like building code violations to make sure that everyone has a safe um, uh, place to live. And then the second component was a lot of cleanup language in the charter, including uh, making our charter gender neutral, which I think is important as we want to recognize everyone's civil rights. And the last one deals with 7-3, uh, and I would like to just talk about that for a minute if, if it's okay. Um, you know, we remember what happened, and. You know, my intentions there were basically to serve the public safety of our city and were intended to serve that core priority. Uh, in retrospect, however, I understand and accept responsibility. There are things that I did that I wouldn't do again. And I'm sincerely sorry to all of you for that, for those things, uh, for the disappointment, uh, for the turmoil that, that this caused in our city. Uh, two years ago when I ran for re-election, I promised to embrace your feedback on this matter focus on working effectively with our management team, and we have a great team in place, so they're really great to work with. I thank you for the opportunity to serve and continue the hard work we've done together. Your confidence in, in me must continue to be earned and never taken for granted. I, I understand that. I've taken these commitments seriously, and while I've taken political positions that some people may disagree with, I'm confident that our valued staff and my colleagues would agree that there hasn't been any issue with me staying in my lane. So while I'll never ask you to ignore what happened or never ask you to forget it, I will humbly ask that you evaluate me on my entire record of service to the people of Alameda, and thank you for allowing me to address this issue. Thank you. Ms. Spencer? Hi, good evening. All right, so yeah. in regards to this question, uh, you're, you're, uh, would you repeat the question? Sorry. This is, as a council member, what would you do should Measure AA not pass? Okay, so I actually um, am not supporting Measure AA. It does have three parts. I actually think that it is somehow written to suggest that it addresses what happens in the future if we have council members uh, have issues with the grand jury. And we did have independent um, 
attorneys come back and say that the city's language was archaic in regards to what to do with that. My opinion is, is that this does not address that issue. It actually, as some of the other candidates have said, it talks about increasing the power of the city attorney to address uh, landlord tenant issues or misdemeanors or other issues that are uh, currently being addressed. However, it actually does not not fix the issue of what happens when we have a repeat of the uh, issue that we just had. And that is actually, sadly, I think voters are thinking this is gonna fix that problem. And it really doesn't. And I think it's honestly a sham by our current council and not all of them uh, supported it. Um, uh, my understanding is member Daysog ended up abstaining. And I think that's important because uh, it really doesn't fix the problem. Voters are thinking it will. It does increase the power of a city attorney's office, which honestly, all of a sudden, that's gonna be very expensive too. That's, all of a sudden, that is more important than the things that regular folks use, like our parks, libraries, COVID issues, things like that. All of a sudden, it's prioritizing those expenses, a city attorney's office expanding it, and that has been expanded under, um, in the last, I'm gonna say, two years. And that is a problem. At some point, we need to bring our budget back to focusing on the needs of regular folk of what a hey, city is um, supposed to be helping them with. Thank you. Uh, there we go. Oh, sorry, my screen froze there, so I wasn't quite sure. But thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. And uh, Mr. Kodiga, again, I'm going to repeat the question. As a council member, what would you do should Measure AA not pass? Well, what I would do, one, I would applaud it because I don't support it either. It's a, it's, it's an aggregation of three separate measures into one. I think, in my opinion, to dilute the real purpose of it, which is the ethic package that we have dealt with with Jim Odie and 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 uh, Malia Vett. And, and, and we'd like to keep your comments to the to the to your I'm, statement, obviously. I appreciate that. And all right, I'll keep the, keep it there. But that was an issue for me. That was a big issue for the city. And what I wanted to say is that the there is no clear path in that section of the ethics that says if such a violation takes place, there is a, a, a way to um, remove a city council member from the board. It seems less clear, much clearer. There's some nice parts about it, but delineation of this is the mats. Uh, but for example, they did not have hiring as a restrictive violation of the charter. Uh, they, they referred back to the state law and I'm not an attorney, but I've understood from some attorneys that there is no state law that really addresses uh, city charter violations. So I would want to make sure that's true. I think the process that took place, the speed to which it was brought to the table without enough public uh, exposure and discussion is a big issue for a big critical effort that all Alamedians need to be pay attention to. So I'm really disappointed with that. So I'm okay with the cleanup issue. I think that's very appropriate. The city manager, uh, the city attorney's section gives them more power, but it does give them discretion. So they don't necessarily have to take on uh, uh, minor issues, but they can, they can take it on their own. I'm not sure I like the discretion. Uh, I know that the district attorney has given us, uh, the city attorney the power to make those uh, minor, uh, minor adjustments. So my, I, would, I would design something that's more forceful and more effective because I don't think we need to have another violation. The last time we had that was in, 19, in the early 1940s. That's how long it took to be violated again. Thank you very much. And Ms. Vela, we'll close this question with your response again. As council member, what would you do should Measure A not pass? I'd be very concerned if it doesn't pass. I think that there's substantial portions, uh, well, everything that's in it really um, uh, needs to go through. Um, the gender neutral terms is kind of, that's, that's basic cleanup that, that really, um, I think speaks volumes. And as a woman, the fact that we, we don't have gender neutral terms is something that bothers me. Um, additionally, there's really archaic provisions of our charter. For instance, we don't have labor and delivery services here in the, uh, in Alameda, in the city of Alameda. I was born at Alameda hospital. That stopped in the 1990s. I'm currently pregnant. If I have complications with my pregnancy, I will have to get council approval to be off island for 30 consecutive days. Even if I'm under medical care, 
that is a huge problem and we would float a huge risk as the city council having a law that's an in effect discriminatory in particular for women um, who are, uh, you know, who are pregnant. Um, and I think that, that, you know, in many ways, we do need to look at our charter. It's a, it's a living document. It should be amended. It has been amended. Um, additionally, I think, so we, we would have to talk about putting it back on or finding ways to insulate ourselves against potential liability. And I think we would have to have that conversation with the city attorney's office um, and do another group of forums. Um, we did have a year of forums. Um, League of Women Voters sponsored a, a few of those events. That was with the vice mayor and council member Daysog. Um, other member, uh, other items that are there in turn in, in also the cleanup of 7-3 that was recommended not only by our independent investigator, uh, it was it was recommended by everybody who looked at our charter. That's also creating a, an, an issue. Uh, it needs to be done and dealt with. Um, and so I was proud to support this measure. Um, I would say that there have been a number of charter violations. We've had council members who, uh, we had a mayor that stole money from the city, uh, went after police officers who, who uh, went after their, you know, arrested their husband for a DUI. Um, this still would need to address those situations. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for responding to those. Um, the next question will begin with Mr. Odie. And we're going to try this again. As a council member, what would you do should Measure Z not pass? Well, what I would do is, uh, first of all, we have a housing element that is due to be recertified next year. So I'd have to work on a housing element that basically includes a charter provision that excludes people from Alameda work with a housing element a recertification that includes um, a ban on multifamily homes, uh, work on a housing element that includes density limits that basically make it more difficult for us to provide affordable housing, both affordable housing <clears throat> for low and for low income people, but also for middle income people, because in order for these projects to pencil out, there has to be, these units have to be of such huge size um, that it just makes it almost impossible to include housing for workforce. Um, you know, I think this is one of the most critical issues uh, on the ballot that we faced in Alameda, and as long as I've lived here, uh, it's, it's a matter of equity, it's a matter, matter of civil rights. You know, we don't need to go very far in our history to see a time when all of, we had laws like this that basically promoted housing segregation and preserve what you know authors call the badges and incidents of slavery. So we'd have to rewrite our general plan and it would not be that complicated. Uh, uh, it would not be as complicated if we didn't have uh, Measure A in the charter. Um, you know, if, if you're at any all in doubt of the purpose of these exclusionary zoning laws. Just look at the president's Twitter feed, you know, and see when he talks about, he's thrilled how he ended a program where low income housing people uh, would not be allowed to quote unquote, invade uh, suburban neighborhoods. So let's call this what it is, racist exclusionary zoning and get it out of our charter now. Thank you. Next, um, Ms. Spencer. I think you're on mute. There you go. Okay. Um, so I am no on Z. I think that uh, we currently have a lot of our housing stock is older, and that is, in fact, what allows many of us to live here. I am a renter, and I rent an older rental. Uh, and if, uh, my opinion, if we didn't have uh, a the two measure A's that in fact passed overwhelmingly, the first one 60%, the second one 80% and 91. And I think any suggestion that 80% of the people that lived in Alameda in 1991 is outrageous. Um, but if in fact, if you look at our housing stock, if developers were, and I'm gonna say unscrupulous developers were allowed to come in, tear down whatever they want, build as high as they want, and uh, some say, oh, well, you've got this historical advisory board. That's right. But all of those could be overridden by three council members. So in existing neighborhoods, you can have all of a sudden, that's why, you know, that's actually why we have the two A's. Uh, but so I, um, 
And I would encourage you to look at uh, the racial diversity of our city. It's actually greater. Our racial diversity has been increasing in the last 50 years. Other cities have been doing the opposite. And I think it truly is because we have um, been able to control uh, housing so that it's not all multi-million dollar homes. If you look at the new stuff that's coming in, it's either rentals so that it's actually people can't just buy it. And I used to fight to try to get workforce housing and I didn't get the support of council. The council wanted and would approve projects that were the strict 85% million dollar plus and then hopefully the 15% affordable, but they did also vote to untether it so the market rate could go first. Um, so I think it is important when you look around the new housing, see if you can go buy something, chances are you're not going to be able to unless you are a millionaire. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Spencer. Okay, and next will be Mr. Cottega. So again, as a council member, what would you do should Measure Z not pass? Well, I would applaud it again. I'm not a, a, I'm a no on Measure Z. I think it does the wrong thing. It's not exclusionary, it's not racist. It is not meant for that. It was not designed for that as, as uh, Trish has shared in uh, 1975 or 70s, if the white was 90% of the population today is less than 50%. We have, and our, our low income levels is 35% of our population. It's pretty darn diverse and I'm very proud of the fact that it is. Uh, that the racism around here is is there, but I see a lot of uh, people of color, uh, of all colors, meeting, talking, playing in the park. So I'm not seeing a lot of that. And I've been here for uh, three generations and uh, wasn't born in the hospital here, but I've, I've grown up and, and eaten a lot of dirt in this town. Uh, the, the, the other part is we've been able to somehow provide more than the required market rate housing by three times what was required. Why do we need to have that much housing? I'm not sure why we need that high density of market rate housing and market rate is not cheap. I don't care if you lower the cost of building it, the developer's gonna take market rate. That means they're gonna take the higher price that they can get. It doesn't matter how cheap they get to build it. Uh, we, that formula of 15% is off. It's just a bad formula. It doesn't pay, provide for the adequate affordable housing we want. I want it. It's, we haven't met it. We're 300 plus units behind. There's programs that we need to chase down to fund those things. I think we should take this new uh, requirement that we have, take the overbuilt, uh, the overbuilt amount that we've had already for the market rate, apply it against that, and then focus on building affordable housing here. That's what we need to do. That's the right thing to do. So that's where I go with it. Thank you. Ms. Vela, I think we're finished there. We'll wait for the clock to get reset. There you go. Uh, I really hope that uh, Measure Z will pass. Uh, it's why I'm supporting it. It's why I uh, voted to put it on the ballot. Um, you know, Article 26 will not stop uh, the state from giving us high RENA numbers. It's not going to stop um, us from, from having to build housing. The demand is going to continue. Um, what it's going to stop us from doing is from zoning these units in a way that meets our needs as a community, that pre preserves our shoreline, which we know we want to do, that offers an ability for uh, the setbacks that we know that we need to address sea level rise. Um, it's going to very much limit the conversation around the general plan, which is very unfortunate. Um, and so I think in many ways, it's uh, the no on Z folks uh, create a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, where we will continue to have unnecessary litigation despite the state density bonus laws and things like that. And we're going to um, be put in a very tough spot. Um, I, I think the first thing that I would do is start talking to people about running an affordable housing bond, because I think a lot of the people, even some of the candidates running for office, don't quite understand um, how the money comes together for affordable housing in our current system. Um, I think that that's something that we're gonna need to talk about because given the general uh, plan constraints that we're gonna have, if Article 26 doesn't pass, that's something that we're absolutely going to have to do. And I would hope that all of the candidates that are running here would join us in that effort. Um, additionally, I think that we're going to have to look at um, having, uh, you know, getting, uh, collecting signatures uh, from voters to, uh, to repeal, or we're going to be forced to, as I said, have a very limited conversation around uh, the housing element of our general plan. I think that's going to be unfortunate. 
Um, so I think we're going to have to do those two things and be solutions oriented, but I think it's going to be very limiting. And so for that reason, I hope that we vote to remove this exclusionary zoning law from our charter. Thank you. And in closing, we will hear from Mr. White. Thank you. Is it working? Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Um, yeah, um, if it does not pass, um, I would first say we need to have um, a direct public conversation. This was put on the ballot in a rush fashion without moving it throughout the city. Um, it was first supposed to be put on the ballot on June 9th um, just to repeal um, one of the three articles. Um, that came back a month later and all three were there put on it. Um, I have a problem with that from a public policy standpoint, particularly because this is such a divisive issue. It's not because of the fact that I, I, I don't believe that the policy may, um, 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 may or may not be racist. That's not the point. The point is right now we're at a very, um, as a city, even a delicate time. And when this was done in June, we were in the middle of a racial, if you will, um, 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 uh, conflict. Um, and and unarguably, we were not exactly a city um, united. Um, I'm into more so having a conversation about the city on the issue so that homeowners and other people who really don't understand the impact that has not been presented if repealed with this measure, what will be the impacts? What is the follow-on plan? How will this square with the housing element and our general plan? There are questions out here that have done more to divide our city than to bring it together. And I say that because um, um, in working with, um, if you will, the um, whole issue around um, race and police here this past summer, um, the one thing we really tried to do in the dialogue is to make sure that people were informed of what the impacts were for the demands that were being made. And we do need to do more education on that. And I'd seek to do that afterward. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we will have time for this. will probably be our last question that is coming up next. Um, Ms. Spencer, you'll be the first to respond to this one. What policies and programs would you suggest to enhance the services for the unhoused population? All right, so while I was mayor, I joined uh, other mayors to go to the uh, Alameda County Board of Supervisors and ask for uh, uh, a, a, pro a proportionate share of funding that they were able to receive from the state. Uh, and we were successful to receive those funds and that is a huge part of uh, taking care of these needs is trying to figure out funding. So it's critical that we uh, work with our Alameda County Board of Supervisors and uh, any partners we can to help fund these uh, uh, needs. And okay, and okay, could you tell me what the rest of the question is? What, what, what policies and programs would you suggest to enhance the services for the unhoused population? Okay, and uh, many of you know that as a city of Alameda, we have our own food bank and that has actually, we are, as far as I know, the only city that has our own food bank. And that is incredible that our city has done that and has had it all these years. We also have our own Meals and Wheels programs. And I think Alamedes are actually really generous at trying to help everyone uh, that is here uh, whether or not they're housed, whether, whatever their background is. And I think that what we really need, another thing we can always do is to help spread the word, reach out to our, or, our philanthropic organizations, our businesses, uh, to help come up with uh, monetary support and other solutions. We have people that cook and donate food, and that's something that I've been part of uh, in the past where we assign certain nights to help uh, people like you know that need that need food where we as a community step up and and honestly that that is something I'm very proud of our community for doing and uh, so reaching out for funds that we can get uh, ourselves stepping up um, and then working together to uh, provide solutions thank you mr. Cottega you will respond to this one next would you like to hear the question again Please, thank you. 
It is what policies and programs would you suggest to enhance services for the unhoused population? Thank you very much. That's always a tough question to talk about unhoused uh, population. There's so many variant, uh, variations and levels of, of what that means. And I think we need to identify what those levels are and see how we can address them one off, one at a time to, uh, to try and achieve what we need to achieve. Trying to catch it all in one is hard to do because there's, as I said, there's too, so many differences. Uh, funding obviously is necessary to have. Uh, we'd, uh, as Trish said, we'd have to uh, chase down whatever regional resources and players and partners we can get. Uh, we look towards our own civil uh, Alameda uh, volunteerism that, that we do. Um, I'm very pleased with what we've been able to do. Uh, in fact, impress what we've been able to do at the food bank and giving out food to the people at, at the base. I just, it's heartbreaking and it's, uh, they've done the overwhelming, the overwhelming effort there. I would look at, the, it's a regional issue too. It's not just an Alameda issue. And we have to look at the whole region. Just to solve it here doesn't solve it anywhere else. And you don't solve it in one community. You have to solve it in the, in the region. So I think regional partnering uh, is important. People have been trying to resolve this thing for ages. And even, you know, Nav, uh, Gavin Newsom has been trying to solve it and he has been unable to, and he has far more power than, than anybody sitting at this table here today. So we would just have to continue to be innovative and think about what the right solutions may be for Alameda, what the best thing for Alameda is, and the Alamedas are here. So that's, uh, that's what we would try and do. Thank you. Ms. Vela, you will be the next to answer that question. Let's get the, we're gonna get the timer reset, there we go. So most recently I was, uh, this past Tuesday, in fact, I was proud to vote for um, uh, spending $100,000 of our CARES Act funding um, to contract with Block by Block uh, to help with our, our business districts on Park and Webster Street um, to assist with um, un uh, outreach to our unhoused populations um, that, are, that are in those areas. Um, they're going to provide services, um, help get folks um, connected with our day center. I was also proud to vote for the expenditure of $103,000 um, to create a build to extend our hours of our day center. As I mentioned, it's uh, now expanding into the weekends and also into the evenings as opposed to just being um, for a few day, uh, hours during the daytime. Uh, I was proud to vote for our secure parking program. Again, during COVID, it's especially important that we um, expand our, our uh, programs to the unhoused, as well as, um, uh, you know, I thank our mayor for, for leading the charge on making sure that we get FEMA trailers um, here in Alameda uh, and working with Alameda County um, to uh, find ways to use our motels uh, to provide housing for our unhoused. Um, I'm proud to say that we have a couple of motels in town that are doing that. Um, and are part of that countywide program with county funding. Um, we've also expanded our uh, contract uh, uh, and expenditures with building futures for women and children. Um, as we know, during a time of COVID, uh, we need to ensure that we have expanded emergency shelter opportunities, especially with domestic violence on the rise. I was also proud to support the wellness uh, and respite center. Um, those are gonna provide critical uh, services to our unhoused population. Uh, we've also uh, redirected staff uh, early in COVID to help out at the food bank. I personally went out and helped with those efforts as well. Um, Meals on Wheels doesn't help if you're unhoused. And I would say the final thing is to make sure that we pass Measure Z so that we can build more affordable housing and get housing equity throughout Alameda. Thank you. Mr. White, would you like that question uh, again? Thank you. Thank you. What, yes, policies and, yeah, what policies and programs would you suggest to enhance services for the unhoused population? Um, I would first like to look at um, reallocating funds um, that we um, can target um, to, um, if you will, um, make that a budget priority. Our city really needs to commit to do its part to ensure that um, the city of Alameda is diverse, inclusive, equitable, and just. Um, we need to take actions to transform our city, um, our city government, um, to provide for all Alamedans, um, especially um, people who are black, indigenous, and, and persons of color um, with physical and mental health care. 
Um, I was a, an advocate of that um, uh, during the um, protests that we had this summer, calling for um, a department, if you will, um, a separate department for public health and wellness um, dedicated to centering, if you will, our most vulnerable um, community members, our unhoused population um, who suffer most greatly from um, uh, mental health, health care, um, and housing in terms of their needs. We need to center those voices in um, changing our systems. Um, we need to build partnerships with other levels of both government, business, and nonprofits here. Um, yes, in better supporting, um, perhaps in partnership, Meals on Wheels, or, or not Meals on Wheels, uh, Yes, either Meals on Wheels in serving uh, and meeting vulnerable needs, but also in terms of our Alameda Food Bank. Um, we also need to be uh, 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 diligent in bringing in or finding a program, whether it's a Kahoot style program or some program that could deliver services directly um, to um, our unhoused population on the street. We need to provide for uh, more affordable housing for low and very low, um, below market rate housing, so that permanent housing so that we can meet the needs of our citizens in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. And the final candidate for this will be Mr. Odie. Thank you. Uh, I guess I would say we continue doing what we're doing. And a lot of that includes, you know, for one, looking at laws that uh, decriminalize survival. I mean, I think that that's super critical. Uh, if you look at services, you know, or, or the, I think there's three prongs of approaching this also, you know, immediate services, temporary shelter and permanent housing. And we've been working on that. Uh, Malia, my colleague, Ms. Vela talked about a lot of the things that we've been doing with COVID, with our HEAP funding and with our CARES Act funding, which, which comes from the state, uh, not even us. Um, you know, we budgeted in the past dollars for mobile outreach with Operation Dignity. Uh, we've worked with APC and, and Building Futures for Temporary Shelters. Uh, with uh, our, our HEAP money this year, uh, we centralized our 211 system for call handling. Uh, one of the things uh, uh, Councilman Bell and I also proposed was doing some joint program with the school district on washers and dryers. Uh, our, our wellness center, uh, you know, that's going to help at risk and homeless seniors. And one of the things we had to do there was, you know, fight back a mean-spirited ballot initiative to rezone this property. Um, if you talk about delivering medical services to our unhoused population, we have community paramedics, which have been doing that for a number of years. And probably the, the biggest issue uh, is housing. And uh, Malia also mentioned uh, Project Room Key, which is using uh, unused hotel rooms, and we're going to cooperate with the county on that. Uh, but one thing that's super exciting, uh, besides the Reshape, Reshape Project, which provide housing for formerly unhoused is the planning board just approved North housing uh, just last month and 586 units and phase one include 90 units of permanent supportive housing for the formerly homeless. So this is a, a very complicated issue. We've been working on it very hard and very diligently. And I do want to give a quick shout out to our mayor and Councilman Ravella who represent us on the League of Cities Committee dealing with housing. Thank you, and thank you all. That, that will be our final question for this evening. Thank you all for your time and your input. And so now we will move to closing statements. You each will get uh, two minutes for your closing statements, and we will start with Mr. Kadiga. There you go. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. First of all, thank you, uh, League of Women Voters, for uh, having this uh, forum tonight. It's always uh, good to challenge one's thinking and uh, we ask questions that are difficult and, and try to be informative and, and direct as possible. So thank you for that opportunity, appreciate it. You know, the citizen of Alameda, I just said, say for yourself and your family, you have a choice. The choice is what kind of community you want, where you want to raise your kids and family, enjoy your neighbors and, and the lifestyle that we have had here and can, can, I hope you continue to have here. My, your choice is implementing uh, smart development versus overdevelopment. I think we're exceeding our needs for development here and it's causing traffic problems, which is a big issue in this town and will always be until we get resolved around our infrastructure, our natural and our uh, structural constraints that we have. Right sizing and supporting our departments so that we are uh, being a working partner, working together with them, whether it's the police or fire or the city departments, we need to work with them. They do a lot of hard work. They put a lot of risk out there and uh, we, sh we should have bought them in the good times and we should work with them in the bad times. 
getting on sound financial ground sounds like we are i don't believe it but maybe we are and I, i'm glad to hear it i'd rather have me wrong and uh, and and the uh the system right ethical leadership is very important to me that's what i'm running on openness uh aspect all alamies have a voice and that voice is loud and should be loud and we should listen to that you know, although all voices even as i said the first time in, in the democratic club was uh new york they, they have a voice. They're intelligent. We should listen to it. But that doesn't mean they override Alameda's voice. If you want a place for safe place for kids and you get around and commute, a place where your neighbors know one another, uh, maintaining our charming neighborhoods and not being overbuilt with infill density, high density, continue our positive legacy, uh, listen to your valuable voice and not just uh, be concerned about some items. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kadaga. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Bella. Thanks again to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum tonight. It's been my honor to serve the citizens of Alameda uh, for the last four years as a council member. In those four years, I have been solutions oriented. I've worked with my colleagues uh, and with our partners at, at different levels of government to make the most of what we have and also to bring in additional funds to the city to actually see things through, make sure that we break ground, make sure that we build affordable housing. COVID-19 has presented challenges to how we live, um, has devastated uh, small businesses, and has in, in some cases put some uh, additional strains on the city budget. Uh, my study leadership and innovative thinking are needed as we work to preserve our city services. We've been able to do this. I want to continue to work with our business partners, uh, our tenants, and all of our stakeholders to make sure that we see ourselves through this pandemic and are as whole as possible. I support Black Lives Matter, and I'm committed to examining our policing policies and tactics, rooting out inherent racism and improving critical services. I'll continue to stand up, speak out, and be a force for racial justice. I'm committed to preserving our shoreline and keeping our neighborhoods distinct and diverse while improving our neighborhood shopping areas and making sure that we do this in an environmental way. This includes solutions to mitigate traffic and make pedestrian and bike safety a priority, a continued priority. I was proud to vote for things like Vision Zero, the Cross Alameda Trail, funding the Atlantic Gap, and we want to make sure that we see these programs through. Finally, I'd like to state that I'm uh, endorsed by State Senator Nancy Skinner, Assemblymember Rob Bontas, County Supervisor Wilma Chan, Working Families, the Democratic Party, the City of Alameda Democratic Club, Alameda Progressives, Alameda Justice Alliance, East Bay Young Democrats, and many other elected officials and community leaders. And I'd be honored to have your vote. My website is maliavella.com. Thank you, Ms. Vela. And Mr. White will be able to hear from, for your closing statement next. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, League of Women Voters, um, and to my fellow candidates, and to you, the audience. Thank you for listening, um, and thank you for your time tonight and for giving me a chance to address you. I'm, um, as I've been saying, I'm, I am listening um, to your questions. I am um, not exactly door to door, but doing a lot of coffee talks on Zoom, and I have been working on solutions that continue to make us one of the most desirable cities in the Bay. I hear you when you say it's time for a change, and I am running for that change um, and to be the face of change here in Alameda. I'm running to bring fairness and equity and open government back to our city. To me, from what I hear from you, that is what begins to equate a trust back within our government. Um, I work to develop sound physical policy, um, safer climate um, and transportation solutions. I am listening so that I can help make Alameda a better community. And I think um, my civil rights and environmental work and in collaborating with whether it's All Faith Coalition or with CASA and with um, 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 Westside Alameda um, Arts, um, my work here in the community is, has been rooted and centered in bringing people together. And I think that's where we really need to start in terms of making policy, especially in times of crisis, is reaching out educating and seeking to bring people into the conversation. Um, I um, can only ask you um, uh, or tell you that I will be listening and I ask you for your support, um, for your endorsement um, tonight um, to do so. I wanna thank you again for this opportunity and um, look forward to um, seeing you on the campaign. 
So again, my name is Amos White. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. And in closing, we will go to Mr. Odie. Am I the last one? I have you are the last second. one. No, no I don't precious. think so. I think no. I missed. Oh, no, there we go again. I did it again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I can't read my own writing. What do sorry, can we restart the clock since I seem to keep messing these things up at this point in time? <laughs> Do you want me to go now or next after? Please, you can go. You, 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 are, you are up now. Second to last. Okay. Well, again, thank you to the league for putting this together, and thank you for uh, the candidates for preparing and, and um, putting on a good forum. Um, you know, I believe if you love Alameda, you have to love all Alamedans. And with your help, I think I've demonstrated that I do and that I spent six years as your council member fighting to protect Alamedans fighting to protect tenants by adopting just cause eviction, fighting to protect our finances by saving money for future OPEB and pension costs and responsibly re raising revenue, fighting to protect low wage workers by increasing the minimum wage, protecting immigrants by becoming a sanctuary city, protecting all residents by examining police policies and call responses, protecting small businesses during COVID with emergency funding and preventing evictions, protecting public safety by prioritizing core services and core emergency response services, protecting against sea level rise with the stormwater fee increase, protecting the unhoused by supporting the wellness center, and protecting the value of housing is a human right, end of sentence, period, stop, by promoting more housing and affordable housing. I've been honored to be endorsed by a lot of the folks that my colleague, uh, Ms. Vela talked about the Sierra Club, the League of Conservation Voters, the Alameda Democratic Party, Alameda Building Trade, Central Labor Council, Fiona Ma, Senator Skinner, Wilma Chan, Alice Leibbicker, Rob Bonta, Fong Lan, dozens of elected colleagues that I've worked with over six years across the East Bay. Progressive Alamedans like Robbie Wilson and Doug Biggs, the Bay Area Reporter, and I would be honored to have your vote for another four years. Again, my name is Jim Odie. My website, www.od4, number four, Alameda, because that's what I am for, Alameda.com. Your council member for the last six years, and with your support and your vote, your council member for four more years. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Odie. And Ms. Spencer, please let me apologize again. I think I just got a little carried away putting lines through names a little earlier than I should. So it looks like we've got the uh, timer reset there. So we Actually, can get started um, with you. Uh, go, go ahead. All right. Uh, so I'm Trisha Herrera Spencer. I'm your former mayor. Um, I was on the school board elected twice for uh, serving six years there, prior to that PTA council, raised four kids in this town. And honestly, I love Alameda and I love Alamedans and we do good work together. My website is trish4u.com. My phone number, 510-761-1523, I'm sorry, 761-5123. Uh, and you can always call me. And that's actually how we solve problems. Um, we worked very well together as a team. Things that were, so my, the spe, why do I run? What's the special interest group I represent? It is actually regular folk, regular folk. If you look at where I get my donations, if you look at who's gonna be knocking on my doors, on doors and help, helping spread the word about my campaign, it's regular folk, it's you and me. Um, uh, we led, so people were concerned about our animal shelter. I led efforts to save our animal shelter, to save Gene Sweeney Open Space Park, to save our golf complex and gyms on the course. I brought the ocean cleanup here to Alameda from Holland because I received a call that staff wasn't returning the call. Could I help? And that was from Alamedans that were concerned. And so I stepped up many, many times, honestly, listening to you. I started the Art and City Hall project to, to have a wall space to take care of so Alamedans could showcase their art. Um, we have serious concerns. One of my priorities is to make Alameda safe for everyone. I did a referral 2017 for a citizen oversight police committee. To me, that is still a priority, but not a, not a committee that meets behind closed doors, a public meeting, just like we do public meetings for all these other things that are important to us. I support Alamedans and your local businesses. We need a pandemic testing here in town. That is a priority. 
We have to figure out how we're going to do this together. We need to rebuild public trust and morale. When you have a grand jury looking at your city and you have problems with two council members, that is serious. Voters need to understand it. It is very serious and we have to address our fiscal issues and I'm asking for your vote to move forward as a city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Spencer, and to all the other candidates. Again, thank you. And I would like to turn the meeting back over to our president, Susan Hauser. Thank you all. Again, please visit our website, lwvalameda.org, where you can find opportunities to donate treasure and time. We look forward to seeing you at our next forum, September 24th, for the, the ballot initiatives. We will then host two community forums, one on September 30th and one October 1st. The topic is Nuts and Bolts, Policing in Alameda. All of these forums will start at 7 p.m. and you can register on our website where you may also join, donate, and find lots of information on all things related to voting. Thank you all for joining us this evening, and please remember to vote. <laughs>